I just think is awesome. It's a puggle. Right? And they will lay eggs, and the eggs are really minuscule. They're very tiny little things. And the platypus is going to be about, eh, the big one will be about that long. Echidna, about that big. And they have some echidnas at the Brookfield Zoo, which is really cool. And I think there's a platypus in the, in the um, California San Diego Zoo, which is the largest zoo in the Americas. Another cool thing about these guys, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. The male echidna, or male platypus, is venomous. They have spurs, projections off their ankle that can deliver venom into a opposing or competing male or a predator, like a human, that wants to grab them. Apparently it hurts like a, like a bullet shot, the bullet wound, but it won't, it's not a neurotoxin or anything like that, right? So just don't pick up a wild platypus and you should be okay, right? It's one of three venomous mammals. I'll show you another one later. The, one of the other ones is the slow loris, which is a, a, a protoprimate. It's a loris, it's kind of like a, a Kind of like a lemur, but not. It's very cute, right? Uh, the other one I'll, I'll show you later, All right? So the other critters that we're going to look at within class mammalia include all of these guys. We're going to look at one order of marsupials or metatherians, and that is order of didelphomorphia. I'm not going to make you remember the specific names of orders or groups or scientific names. That's for my mammalogy class students, right? But it's important to know how we group them together, right? So order didelphomorphia is only a small subgroup within the overall group of uh, metatherians, marsupials. <coughs> yeah. Monotremata is a subclass, right? They're all mammals. Make sense? Okay. So we'll talk about rodents. Lagomorphs, eastern cottontail. Uh, carnivores, which there's a specific group that contains carnivores, but that doesn't mean other critters can't be carnivorous. Does that make sense? These are just the species that we call carnivore. Right? Insectivoras, although that's a little bit different now. Artiodactyla, which is a deer, and then Chiroptera, which is bats. Okay? So let's start with order didelphomorphia and our single marsupial here in North America, which is Didelphus virginiana or the Virginia opossum, right? Marsupial, omnivorous, they will eat anything that they get their, their jaws on. Nocturnal, although I'm seeing a lot of uh, possum activity in my um, camera traps during the day. So they will come out during the day, but we see them a lot at night. They're semi-arboreal. Arboreal means in the trees. So you can see possums on the ground. You can see them up in the trees. And what helps them with the trees is that prehensile tail. They do have a prehensile tail. And their tails are what we call encrassated, which is a fancy word for fat. They're chunky tails. Right? And they keep a lot of fat in there and muscle, which allows them to have a lot more hold, a lot more, uh, I guess, support. Right? So one of the easy ways to catch a possum, if you really want to, is just grab them by the base of the tail and they're perfectly fine. And they won't bite you. Somewhat of an invasive on the back of anthropogenic change, they're really good at surviving what we do to them, what we do to the environment. So that includes um, rats, mice, raccoons, possums, cockroaches. They will all survive us. Right? So we'll have a lot of possums later on. Now, this is an opossum. It's not a possum. Possums are different groups in Australia only. And there are some in South America, actually. This is an opossum. A little bit different. I mean, if you really want to, you can be like, no, that's an opossum. Get it right when you're telling someone. Possum tracks, they're really easy to differentiate because they, they have a thumb, right, that extends off the side, 
right? So it almost looks like a raccoon. They have a little bit longer fingers and they have long claws, which you can see here. But raccoon's thumb is straight, like that, whereas an opossum thumb is like this, right? Kind of like a human hand, small human hand with, uh, with claws, claw indentations, like that one right there. Another really easy way to identify certain types of mammal tracks is the behavior associated with it. So if you see a track that's on the ground, then all of a sudden it jumps onto a tree and walks up the tree, that's probably a possum or a raccoon, right? At least one that's that size. It's not a dog or a cat. Okay, so behavior is really key when you're looking at tracks. Okay, so that's possums. And if you have any questions, about any of these critters, just shout them out. All right? I like talking about mammals, as you can see. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about stories, we'll talk about anything. And every once in a while, I'll tell you a story of some of these critters. Uh, the next one is order rodentia, or the gnawing mammals, the rodents. Like I said, is by far the most diverse and species-rich order of mammals. There are far more rodents than there are any other type of mammal on this earth. And like I said before, they outcompete many different organisms. They are very good at what they do. <clears throat> Only have two incisors above and below, and those are those open-rooted uh, teeth that continue to grow all the time. Here's a skull of the second largest rodent in the world. And there's the open-rooted teeth right there. The second largest mammal uh, or rodent in the world. What is it? That's a beaver. Second largest mammal in the world. What's the lar or rodent? Excuse me. What's the largest rodent in the world? It's a capybara. Yeah, which is actually a uh, type of porcupine. They're highly related porcupines. Yep. Uh, which is related to porcupines as well. Is it really? I gotta get me a capybara. The big males, if you wanted to, you could probably ride them too. At least my kid could. They get big. Yeah. Anyway, I can talk about capybaras all I want. What is it? There's a zoo that used to have them, and I would go to that zoo only because of the capybaras. Yeah, Akron. That's where I saw them. Yeah. There is a distinct space, diastema, between the incisors and the molars. That's a diastema. That is a evolved missing tooth. What is missing? Incisors, some molars, premolars, canine, right? So they lost the canine and you have this diastema. And there's a lot of different critters that will have that, like these guys. They have a diastema between the incisors, lower incisors. They don't have upper incisors, and the molars. Right? That's a deer. Close relatives to rabbits and other lagomorphs, which we'll talk about soon, but they are different. A rabbit is not a rodent. A rabbit, a cottontail rabbit, it's a lagomorph. All right, so some basic rodents that we'll have around here includes the eastern fox squirrel, which is the chonkers of the squirrels. It's the biggest one that we have around here. Uh, they form leaf nests called drays, which you can see up in these trees. It's this weird leafy bird's nest. It's really big. It's actually a squirrel nest, right? It's a dray, D-R-E-Y, right? In winter, they will hang out in tree hollows, but they do not hibernate. Right? What is hibernation? They sleep. They actually don't really sleep. It's actually their body temperatures drops. Exactly. It's a, essentially a slowing down of their physiological metabolism. Yeah, they're zen. I like that. Uh, they're territorial. These fox squirrels will chase off everything else. Um, and they're the bigger ones, so they usually outcompete the other squirrels. 
Although I have seen a red squirrel chase off fox squirrels. The red squirrels are small, so they're bad. Usually, yeah. Although gray squirrels are better in some circumstances, but usually the fox squirrels are better. They miss 10 to 20% of the nuts that they bury in the fall. That's what they do. They grab a nut, they might eat one of them, and then they'll bury the other one haphazardly throughout your yard. Right? They don't have stockpiles or anything like that. Just grab a nut and bury it. And they hope by random chance that when they go out there, they smell it and they, they uh, dig it back up. So they miss 10 to 20% of the things that they bury, and that contributes to forest regeneration. So one of the reasons why we have oak trees and hickory trees popping up everywhere is because the fox squirrels are planting them for us and other squirrels, right? Now, the trees, I love this, the trees defend themselves because usually the fox squirrels and the chipmunks just devour all of the acorns and hickory nuts. They defend themselves and their progeny by having mask years where the trees are just full of acorns. Like once every four years, they have enough energy to just generate tons of acorns. And they throw all of these acorns out there, and there's not nearly enough for the squirrels to eat all of them. So there's a lot more buried in the ground. Right? And a lot of seed trees do that same thing. Yeah, it depends on, on the type of tree. So the ones with big seeds will do that. Maples will do that too, although they have the, the whirly gig uh, ones. No, absolutely. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be. That would be interesting to look at. So you can identify a fox squirrel because it's bigger, but also the tail has red hairs intermixed in it. Compare that to a gray squirrel, which has silver hairs intermixed. That's that and size the main difference between these guys. So if you see one jumping around and it's it's a redhead essentially, it's going to be a fox squirrel. Okay, those are squirrel tracks. They're really easy to identify because a squirrel track goes from one tree to another tree, and then it disappears up the tree. Right. Yeah, your bird feeders. <laughs> All right. What about black squirrels? They're melanistic subgroup of usually eastern gray squirrels, but it can be fox squirrels as well. Um, so this is you, this is a gray squirrel. You can see the silverish hair, although it's kind of a blurry picture. Um, and then black squirrels can also be introduced because someone's like, "That's cute. I want them in my yard." Like, bring them to your yard. So we can have fox squirrels in, or, uh, um, black squirrels in certain places. There's also a weird population of albino gray squirrels in southern Illinois that just happened to take off. And that wasn't introduced. They just have these albino gray squirrels that have been doing pretty well there. Yeah. So where I am from, Ohio, everywhere's black squirrels. Yeah. And here, I've only seen them in one neighborhood mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. So that has to do with gene flow and uh, success of certain black squirrels. So if they happen to be doing good, it happens to be the biggest one with the most energy and things like that, they have more babies, and then you have more black squirrels around. So something in that part of the area just makes black squirrels better than the other ones. Maybe they blend in with certain trees or something like that. I'm not sure. Say again? Aggression? Ah. So much more aggressive. So actually, that's a side note. Um, eumelanin, which is the black uh, color, uh, can actually be related to testosterone. Individuals with more eumelanin usually have more testosterone. But, and this is something I talk about in animal behavior that I teach, more testosterone does not necessarily mean more aggression. Right? So when you say, like, oh, that dude's got a lot of testosterone, in humans, it's not related to aggression at all, or anything of the, like the manly thing. Uh, oftentimes, testosterone can be related to parental care, can be related to a whole bunch of different things. But uh, there are some black mane lions that are more aggressive, and that's because they have a lot of eumelanin and a lot of testosterone. Right? So yeah, I, I, that makes sense. 
Marmota Monax. So I tell my students that they can remember the scientific names if they use a Russian accent. And it can it helps. This is the groundhog, the woodchuck, the whistle pig. It has 12 different common names. It has 12 different common names. That's why we have scientific names, because there's only one scientific name. It's Marmota Monax. Right? This is a giant squirrel. It's a giant ground squirrel. Right? It's related to marmots, which you find out in the, there's like a yellow-tailed marmot, which you have in the Rockies. Mostly herbivorous, although I will say that anything that is herbivorous can also eat meat. There's been some pictures of deer eating or scavenging, meaning eating meat, right? Deer have been nibbling my um, chicken legs that I use as bait. Typically live two to three years, breed in early spring, and this is a true hibernator and is one of the biggest hibernators. Depends on if you agree that bears truly hibernate. Some people do, some people don't. And I, I need to be convinced that it's true hibernation. Oh, like the, the, the physiology is a little bit different than a true hibernator. They don't go nearly down as, say, bats or other hibernators, right? But it's because they're a bigger bodied organism, so it's harder for them to go all the way down to like four degrees Celsius, right? Which is what bats do. Uh, so they make burrows that are essentially fortresses with 50 feet of tunnels running up to six feet, 16 feet down. They are truly fortresses. And one of our other professors had one uh, underneath his shed, and that shed then sank into the ground. <laughs> so they had to get rid of the, the woodchuck. Um, but what's really cool is they are what we call ecosystem engineers, where they build ecosystems, and then other species will use those ecosystems. Like foxes and coyotes will use abandoned woodchuck hollows. I say abandoned because they were probably eaten, right? So it wasn't abandoned. Anyway, um, and then rattlesnakes, all sorts of different things. He actually put a camera trap uh, in looking at the burrow first before he take it, uh, took it out. And there's cats, there's possums, there's raccoons, there's chipmunks, there's everything going out into that. Yeah, I haven't heard that. I should look into that. That's cool. Yeah, pikas are awesome. We might talk about pikas. We don't have them here. Um, Eastern chipmunk. Tamia striatus. Um, also, I call it the mini bear because they are ferocious. Um, when you capture them, they know judo. So they will, if you're holding them by the scruff, they will bring their back foot up and leverage that over so they can go, Grow! and it hurts. Um, spend most of their time collecting food for the winter, have underground nests about three feet below the surface, live two to five years. Yeah. yeah, territorial, right? So they'll chase off other similar sized things and rely on a food cache for overwintering, right? So they will make it. Yeah, they can. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, that's really annoying thing with chipmunks is that they, they essentially take your bird seed and plant it, and then you have sunflowers popping up when you don't want them. usually by themselves, but they're going to be a bunch living near your house because there's a bunch of food there. Oh, so anecdote. Uh, when I was backpacking in the mountains, uh, we had territorial mini bears, and uh, one of us accidentally put our tent on top of their hole. And so we were hanging around by the, the not campfire because we weren't putting fires there, uh, the camp stove getting ready for dinner, and we heard, shoo, and what was happening was the chipmunks were climbing up a tree, hurling themselves off the tree, landing on top of the tent, and then whoop, sliding down the tent. And they kept doing it again and again and again. The best thing I've ever seen with a chipmunk. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Have you seen this critter?
That one. Oh my God. This is a 13 line ground squirrel, which is essentially the plains version of a chipmunk. It is not an Easter, and this is Spermophilus tridecum lineatus, which is fun to say. Uh, tridecum lineatus, 13 line ground squirrel. Can you say that with the West Yeah. Spermophilus, no, I can't. <laughs> Um, so, me and the uh, India DNR mammologists are convinced that these guys are making their way eastward, right? They are Midwestern, mostly Dakota's big plains areas. We have them in just across the border uh, in, in Illinois. They might be expanding into like Kankakee Sands area, Morocco area, where there's a lot of plains. We think they, they might be expanding it here into northeastern Indiana. So if you see one, find my email, zonpfw.com, and email me. And I'll come and bring some traps out there, because these guys are so cool. Yeah. No, there's not much, except for, uh, there's oftentimes people say, oh, I saw one of those, and it's a chipmunk. Yeah. Chipmunks are really different, but they're so stinking cute. Oh, yeah, so Franklin's, yeah, Franklin's ground squirrels are an endangered ground squirrel that's like that big that's in the uh, western Indiana. And we're working on uh, getting those reintroduced, and so they're more prevalent throughout the state. Um, and there are different types of ground squirrels. So there's Franklin's, there's some other ones that are more in the Dakotas in that region. Mm -hmm. There's anecdotes that Brad, the DNR biologist, hears, and he, he gets tons of phone calls, which you should call them. If you f find something cool, give them a call. And they actually have a new system called Report a Mammal, yeah. which is online. You can just report it there, and we use that data. In fact, one of my uh, grad students is using data on gray foxes that was collected that way to do a really awesome project. So that data is good. So anecdotes based on what people have seen. That they might be here. Muskrat, Ondantra zibethicus. <laughs> Muskrat. Super cute, super soft. If you guys want to pet them, so soft. And that's all that under fur and all that sebaceous gland uh, oil that essentially conditioned the fur throughout the years that this was alive. Have semi webbed feet. Not completely webbed, semi-webbed. Help keep marshes open by eating cattails. It's really so good. Yeah. Yep. And these guys are everywhere in Eagle Marsh and any other type yeah. of small uh, wetland lodges. That's a, a muskrat lodge used by other species like Canada geese. You can lay nests on there. Uh, birds, turtles will sun themselves on top of it. Uh, they will burrow into levees, which are essentially guards against flooding. It can be a problem because if there's a hole in the levee, that's not good. Can stay submerged for more than 15 minutes. So if you see one, you scare it, you're not going to see it again. Right? Unless you spin there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, its tail is rounded, although just the way that we've prepped this, it looks a little different. But it's rounded and it's naked like a rat tail. Right? But it is a little, there's a little bit of fat in there. It's a little incrassated, so it's got more support. Right? There is a little flattening too, so it can have kind of a, a rudder, kind of, but not nearly as much as a beaver. Right? It's got a rounded rat like tail. That's a muskrat. What's the difference between a lodge and a pop up? I've always heard it's a different hmm. I haven't heard pop up, but same thing. Not a beaver. The beaver's going to have an actual stick lodge, okay. or they can also get into uh, banks and things like that as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I, I know that there are, I mean, there's tons of beavers out there. We got a lot of camera trap of beavers next to the barn in that big wetland there. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where they're lodging, but I haven't looked throughout the entire area. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, what else about these guys? Oh, these are actually uh, more closely related to voles, not moles, voles, than they are to beavers. This is essentially a really big mouse-like thing. Yeah, so here's a vole. Here's a muskrat. This is just a gigantic vole. It's evolved for water. I haven't, but I'm I'm not. I don't think that that's far fetched. I think that that certainly could happen. No. Uh, muskrats will actually have family groups where the daughters will help raise the next round of of babies from the parents, but the males get kicked out by the the parent, and then the males kind of wander around looking for other places, and that's when they get eaten. Right, so that you lose a lot of males, juvenile males that way, but that gives the predators food. Muskrat tracks, the, some of them can be uh, webbed, but you have the trail or the tail dragging in the snow and the mud, and it's not a flat tail like a beaver, it's a muskrat tail. And it's near aquatic areas, it's near rivers, streams, ponds, things like that. Beaver, Castor canadensis. No beaver, there it is. Second largest rodent in the world, like I mentioned. This is one of the largest beaver skulls I've ever seen. Yeah, it's chonkers. Um, I had to, unfortunately, I had to uh, stuff this guy. Um, that took forever. Um, but that's a gigantic skull. Highly adapted for aquatic lifestyle have truly webbed feet, and a dorsal ventrally compressed tail, pancaked, dorsal ventrally. Why? How does that help them? Yeah, it's a, or a propeller, right? Instead of like a fish tail, which goes side to side, this one goes right? Uh, it's also used for other things. So it's an alarm call where they hit it against the water, and it freaks me out whenever I hear it. And you can hear it for a long way away, and they form family groups as well. So one hits it, the other ones go straight to the lodge. Right, really good alarm call. Eats a cambium from many trees, which is inside of the bark, um, as well as roots and tubers, and they will, what was